no name under heaven whereby men can be saved except by the name Jesus. At the name Jesus, every knee shall bow and every tongue shall confess that he is Lord. The name of the Lord is a strong tower. The righteous run into it and they are saved. Thank you for tuning in tonight. All of our AVLM members and friends and viewers, thank you so very much for joining us in the Midweek Connect. The Lord has been good to us now throughout this week thus far. He's brought us to the middle, the midweek point, the end of the week, and we are grateful, we are appreciative for the Lord's provision, for the Lord's protection, for the Lord's power revealed to us uh, in the earth. We have so much to be grateful for, uh, so much that we're thankful unto God for. Uh, we're just thankful that, again, you have joined in, you've taken the time to hallow this moment and to be with us here in the Midweek Connect. Some of you may have, uh, at least the AVLM members, uh, have received the text that one of our mothers in Zion has gone on to be with the Lord, Mother Elizabeth Curry, has transitioned, and even to some of our friends and viewers that may be aware, she's one of our long-standing members of our foundational church, the True Evangelistic Temple, and uh, faithful member to the church and we are pleased that God has in his sovereignty and with his wise counsel have chosen to remove her from uh, the walks of life in this earthly realm as we know it and has moved on to the shores beyond this realm the shores in uh, heaven the place and presence of God so we are, we are uh, encouraged to know that she loved God with all of her heart. She loved her family. She loved her church family and her pastor and leadership. And so again, we inform everyone that she has transitioned to be with the Lord and more information will be forthcoming. Uh, but we thank God. We thank God because God, he does all things. He does all things well. He does all things well. We're going to get right into it tonight to the word of the Lord. Uh, in Hebrews, that's where we're going tonight. Hebrews uh, chapter number 11 is where we will commence in reading. And even our dissertation for tonight, this time in the word, will uh, find its precedence out of Hebrews 11. Hebrews 11. Now, as theologians would suggest that the uh, writer of Hebrews uh, is unknown. But there are most scholars and theologians that would accredit the writing of Hebrews uh, to Paul in its style, its tenor, and even its language that's used. Uh, it's accredited to be a Pauline epistle, though for certainty, again, scholars and theologians would suggest that the writing is unknown. Nonetheless, in its writing, we find that uh, there are three specific exhortations there are three specific exhortations when you read throughout Hebrews, the 13 chapters in Hebrews. Uh, it is the exhortation first regarding doctrine, doctrine. And that doctrine speaks of uh, the personhood and the work of Jesus Christ. In fact, when you read in chapters one through chapter two, it talks about the uh, personhood and the work of Christ in its finality, its revelation, its, its unfolding and its understanding. And then it begins to move into uh, the superior posture that Christ has in the sense where uh, it was the superior posture uh, over the angelic beings. As you read through chapters two, even going into three, and then even his superiority to Moses and Joshua as relate to the rest that chapters 3 and chapters 4 and even 4 going into uh, chapter 7 begins to talk about a rest and then we see where that there is uh, as, you, as you lean more into chapter 4 it talks about the Levitical priesthood and, and the superiority that Christ had in that sense over the priest he becomes our high priest. And then you go uh, chapters uh, four into seven, and then eight right into chapter 10, and begin to talk about the idea that the new covenant, 
being a better system than the old. Better is used in the sense where, uh, not to suggest that the old was not good, but better in the sense of perfect, complete. Christ comes in the volume of the book. He joined both the old and the new. There could be no testament without the testor, and that is Christ. So better uh, in, its, in its definition or its term used is not to reduce the old system. But the new covenant becomes a better or more complete, perfect, because of Christ. And you fast forward right through chapters 8 and 10, where you come to the place of where we are uh, tonight, commencing in our reading, chapter 11, which now talks about the exhortation, not just about doctrine and the personhood of Christ, and the work of Christ, and the work of the cross, but through example through examples. And so there are a list of examples that even some scholars would refer to chapter 11 of Hebrews being the uh, hall of the heroes of faith, the heroes of faith. And they are those examples in chapter 11. And then you move be beyond chapter 11 and deal with one more exhortation, and that is the exhortation to holiness in Hebrews chapter 12. In fact, it says in 12, 14, follow peace with all men. Holiness without no man shall see the Lord. And then there is the general salutation in chapter 13, where the different ones are thanked and recognized for their contribution. But those are the three, when you look at Hebrews in an overview or a, uh, an outline, if you had to structure the 13 chapters, there's an exhortation uh, to doctrine concerning the work of Christ and the personhood, chapters 1, all the way through chapter 10. Then chapter 11 stands out by itself, where that there's an exhortation to the examples who have been role models, who have uh, blazed the trail, who has created a pattern that we can follow. We find them in chapter 11, and then the exhortation to holiness in chapter 12. So let's take a look at it here. We're going to skip all the way down to verses number uh, 13 through 16, because we will extract our focus thought from verses 13 through 16 of Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11. Hebrews chapter number 11 beginning at verse number 13 through 16. say such things declare plainly that they seek a country and truly if they had been mindful of that country from whence they came out they might have had opportunity to have returned but now they desire a better country that is an heavenly wherefore God is not ashamed to be called their God for he hath prepared for them a city father in Jesus name tonight Oh, we want to thank you for this, the reading of your word. We thank you for our time of gathering and our connection in the midweek. Bless as we receive this word that we might live by it. In Jesus' name, amen. Thank God. I want to, uh, for our subject matter tonight, magnify the first clause of verse number 13 out of Hebrews 11. And it reads, these all died in faith. That's our subject matter. These all died in faith. These all died in faith. I was listening to the news uh, just today, and uh, you know, it, it's certainly a tragedy, and, and our hearts do mourn, and, and we pray, and, and, and we're sorrowful, and even as I make reference to this uh, staggering number that's increasing itself daily as related to the pandemic of, uh, that this country and even beyond its shores have been affected by. 
but a death toll of some uh, over 200,000 people is just daunting. It's, it's, it's unimaginable. It's, it's hard to just wrap your head around those numbers to know that uh, this pandemic and this, and this crisis have taken the lives of so many some of which that we've even known and have had relationship and those of you that are watching and we're praying for you, perhaps family members and loved ones and, and extended family. Uh, I make reference to that number and even the report that I heard uh, because you could almost become numb if, if you're not careful to your surroundings and the circumstance of your day and it's time uh, because if circumstance around you does not change uh, and it continues to linger and progress and carry on, you, you, you sort of become accustomed to hearing uh, you know, the reports, again, progressively, the numbers uh, increasing and the reports progressively getting worse. And, and you develop this whole feeling of, of trying to almost block out and, and tune out Yet it still it still exists, and if tonight, though this might be a, a morbid subject, it might be a trying subject, but but it is a necessary subject as I'm led of the Lord to talk with you tonight and, and to minister out of this text. If if we were to consider tonight uh, this subject matter, these all die in faith. As I was uh, reading and preparing to minister this word tonight. I begin to think about those numbers that I just quoted and, and ask myself, I wonder how many of those individuals have the testimony of this written word that these all die in faith. You know, when a baby is born into the world, as there are mothers who are watching that are expecting it, even mothers who have given birth, it's, it's an exciting time in a family, you know, the addition, the expansion, the reproducing of life and, and you're making all the preparations necessary to uh, make the arrival of that that new life, uh, that precious new life. You're doing everything you can to make sure uh, that uh, things are in place and, and uh, there's space and there's room and, and there are clothing items and, and all those different uh, things that we do to make sure that the arrival of that baby is not only safe uh, but we want to treat that life uh, with dignity and respect and make sure that we provide for it. We do. Then that life begins to grow and develop and goes to its different stages of infancy and that of a toddler and then that of an adolescent, and teenager, and, and, and then a young adult and then an adult and, and live long enough to become a senior in life. Our life goes through its phases. And if tonight, as I alluded to say a minute ago, you had the challenge of writing your own obituary, of looking at your own life, of, of, of writing the tale of your life, scripting it, what would it say at the end of it? What would it say? What would it say? You know, as a preacher and a minister of the gospel and even a pastor having had to eulogize so many uh, individuals over the course of my ministry over 20 years, 25 years of preaching, uh, I've seen time and time again where that in the obituary read, it starts out after uh, depicting the origin, place, location of birth, and, and to whom the deceased was born to, and talks about and gives credence to their uh, schooling and uh, job, and eventually it moves into uh, the area as to whether or not they ever committed their life to Jesus Christ, as to whether or not they ever joined the church, were they ever part of a uh, religious reformation. And so it goes into that part, and uh, you know there are some uh, that you read that at a young age, they committed their life to Christ. At a young age, they joined this church. Uh, how would it read concerning you? How would your life read? How, how would your obituary read? How would the celebration of life read we read here concerning, as we will call out at least four of them tonight, in Hebrews chapter 11, it says that these all died in faith. Because there are some people who, they start out good, but they don't always finish good. 
There are some people who you can remember at one point in their life, they made a commitment, they, they became a member of a church, and they stray away. And there are some that never make it back. They never make it back. If that's you watching uh, tonight and listening and, and, and viewing, if you find yourself in a place where at once upon a time, you made a commitment, but you see where that, even in this time, in this space tonight as you're listening, that maybe it's time for you to renew your commitment. It's time for you to uh, renew your commitment to God, your devotion to God. Maybe you were a part of a church, but you've not been an active member. You've not been active. You've not been active in attending. You've not been active in watching and viewing. You've not been a You've not been an active member in your giving of your tithe and supporting your local church. Tonight could be a night where you renew your commitment. You know, the Bible says in Romans 10, 17, that faith cometh by hearing and hearing by the word of God. It was the preaching of the gospel of Jesus Christ that once upon a time drew you. Uh, maybe you weren't drawn. Maybe you as a child came up in a home where your parents took you. So they brought you up in the things of God and you became of a certain age and felt like there were certain liberties and freedoms that you wanted to take advantage of and you straight away, you straight away, you straight away. If the Lord was to require your soul tonight, where will you spend eternity? In your straying away phase, in your disconnected phase, in the place where you are not at full peace with God. How will the celebration of life in its script read for you? How will it read for you? If there is a question mark over your head as to how that would be summarized and, and, and how your, your family will do their best, will do their best uh, to speak well of you, there's a question mark over your head. Only you can erase that. Only you can change that. And, and I summon you by the power of the Holy Spirit. While that there's breath in your body. That you would take serious this challenge. Because it's not how you started. It's how you finish. And depending on where you are now. Has much to do with how you will finish. But my prayers as we dig further into this text. And we talk through this text that you will find yourself as one of the heroes of faith. And, and that at the end, when that time come, it will be said of you that these all die in faith. You know, the initial faith that we have to believe that Jesus Christ died, was buried, and rose from the dead is wonderful. The fact that at one point we repented of our sins and accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior is wonderful. The fact that even as a child we were brought up in the things of God and we learned scripture verses and, and, and church jogging and, and church activity. And, and that's great. That's great. But where are we now? Where are we now? God asked a question to Adam in Genesis chapter 3. Adam, where art thou? Where art thou? And every now and again we've got to take inventory. and We've got to assess and find out where are we now? Where are we now? Where are we now? Is our heart toward God and the disciplines of the faith that we once knew? The disciplines such as prayer. How often do we pray? Do we, do we only seek God in a crisis? Do we only call on God in an emergency situation? Or, or is our communication with God fervent and consistent? Is it, is it early in the morning? Is it midday? Is it in the evening? Is it as often as it need to be? Not because we have a need, but because we love to talk with him. We love to communicate to him. We love to hear from him. What's the discipline of our reading life? Have we even read our Bible today? Have we read one verse? What is our commitment to God in the disciplines of prayer and reading of the Bible and even in fasting? When we're frustrated and aggravated and angry and, and find ourselves acting in ways that displease God. Do we check ourselves? The Bible says in 1 Corinthians 11, but let a man examine himself. Judge yourself. Deal with yourself. Get yourself together. Be 
had to measure your prayer life. You had to measure. You had to measure your fasting. You had to measure the reading of God's word, the support toward the house of God, the disciplines that we once knew and we once practiced. Where are we now? Where, where, where do they or how much value do they hold in our life? It's a question that only, that only you can ask. When we look here in Hebrews chapter 11, verse number 1, it says, Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, is the evidence of things not seen. So if faith had to be described, it would be described as what becomes tangible to the things that we expect, we anticipate. It becomes the, the evidence, the factual proof of things not seen. So it's what's in the invisible that becomes even in the natural manifested only by our belief in God's word, in God, for who he is, in what he has said. It takes what's invisible and manifests it. It brings it to the natural, from the supernatural to the natural, it appears, by our belief in God, our trust in him. And not only our trust in him, but according to Mark 11, 23, even our confession. Even our confession. I was, I was thinking today as I was moving and, 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 and going to and fro that it is our confession that changes circumstance. The circumstance around us. That's right. What you have to say concerning it. That's why you got to be very, very careful what you say about where you are and, and the circumstance around you. Because there's power, according to Proverbs 18.21, in your tongue, in the spoken word. So now faith is the substance of things hoped for. It is the evidence of things not seen. So faith becomes the bridge between what you're expecting to happen and where you are right now. Faith becomes the bridge. It becomes the link. And so what happens is you ask God for healing. And then you begin to confess, Lord, I am healed by your word, by your power. I am healed by your name. You begin to confess. You begin to say it. So it is your trust in God that becomes the bridge between what you're expecting in the, in the realm of healing until it manifests in your body, until the physical ailments and, and sicknesses in your organs and, and things of that nature is gone. It, and faith becomes, it becomes the bridge where you're looking and expecting for a financial breakthrough. And you're, you're believing and you're confessing and you're reading God's word and you're regurgitating the word and calling back the word and, and speaking into the atmosphere. It is your trust in God that becomes the bridge between what you are expecting and its manifestation. And faith now is. So faith does not wait for it to be seen in the natural, for it to be seen in the spirit. Faith does not wait for it to appear in the natural, for it to be spoken in the spirit. You've got to speak it first. You've got to see it in the spirit first. Speak it into the atmosphere. Then it appears according to your faith. Many miracles that Jesus, when you read throughout the New Testament and the synoptic gospels, Matthew, Mark, and Luke, and even John, many miracles that Christ performed, uh, it was as a result of the faith of the one seeking that he granted them their requests, even according to your faith. We go into verse number two of Hebrews 11. Now faith is the substance of things hoped for, is the evidence of things not seen. For by it, the elders obtained the good report. The elders, those that were seasoned, those that have come before us, as even the scriptures mentioned, they received a good report. There were good things said about them, but only because they had faith. Then it says uh, in verse number three, through faith, we understand that the world were framed by the word of God. Nothing that exists exist except God spoke it. The world were framed by the word of God. Here's our first example tonight. These all died in faith, verse number 13. It said in verse number four that Abel, he offered up a more acceptable offering than Cain. It was accepted by God, but not just because Abel offered it up. It was by faith that he offered it up. And so he makes the list that verse number 13 talks about from where, again, we extract our subject matter. He makes the list. 
And the first point that I, that I leave with you is, while you're traveling through, make a contribution. Make a contribution. It says that Abel offered up an acceptable offering. See, when your contribution is acceptable to God, when your contribution through life has impact on others, like a teacher that teaches a student or a coach that mentors a player or a trainer and a trainee and, or a parent and a child, a grandparent and a grandchild, a husband to his, to his wife or a wife to her husband, and, 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 and these roles, they differ, or even a great employee, every now and again, the jobs will recognize employee of the month. That is to suggest that somebody's made a contribution. Somebody has gone above and beyond. Somebody has, has done something worthy of recognition. They've made a contribution. They have had an impact. Where it is, uh, over in Genesis chapter number 30, Laban says in verse number 27 to Jacob, I just want you to know that before you depart from me, before you leave, I have learned by experience that I am blessed because of your sake. And uh, we talked about the idea of impressionable impact. When your life has such significance that your appearing into a room makes the difference. That your voice on the other end of the phone brings calm and peace. I, I can't tell you how many times that there have been uh, those members in crisis situations the trauma of losing a loved one, the, the, the trauma of having a mental meltdown, uh, the trauma of emotional turmoil. And God used me as their pastor and leader, as an anointed vessel, to just show up and peace came to their soul. Sometimes to just walk by them, there are those that have testified, came back and said, when you walk by, man of God, I was healed. I was healed. It is, it, is, it, is, it is something about you and the grace of God upon you that God will use your life in such a way that like Abel, you can make the list in point number one by making a contribution. Making a contribution. What is your contribution? What is your impact? What, what, what do you have to show? By the time you get to the end of your life, you want you want to be able to say, like the writer said, that these died in faith. Abel, by faith, offered an acceptable offering to God. He made a contribution. And I challenge you tonight to make a contribution. Make a contribution to the next generation. Make a contribution to those that are around you. Don't always look for their help. Be of help. Be of assistance. Don't always look for someone to call and reach out to you. You call, you reach out. You just never know the difference that that call or that text or even being led. There are times I'm just led by God to pray in an instance for you, ABLM, different members. The Lord places you upon my heart. Sometimes I text you and give you what thus saith the Lord. The Lord deals with me in that way. What am I doing? Is I'm obedient to God. As I'm offering my life to him, that it would be an acceptable sacrifice. He blesses me to make a contribution to somebody else. This is how you join the list. This is how you become a part of the uh, category of these all dying in faith. Not only do we have Abel, but as we move on in point number two, the Bible says that uh, Enoch, he walked with God and he did not see death. He was translated. He was changed. He walked with God until he existed no more in the earthly realm. But he didn't see death. He was caught up. He was translated, changed. But at the end, it says, because he pleased God. He had a testimony that pleased God. Let me tell you how you become part of the category of these who die in faith. Not only do you make a contribution in life, having impact, allowing God to use your life, but you testify until it pleases God. You testify until it pleases God. And I'm not just referencing the testimony that we think is we used to have in what we call uh, coming up in the church, devotional services, where we give an honor to God and to the leadership and to all the dignitaries and everyone that's important and we begin to tell of God's goodness. That is true, that is necessary. That is significant, but 
but I'm talking about the testimony of your life, your life, your life, that even if the words of your mouth does not spew out, there is something about your character, there is something about your persona, there is something about your behavior that glorifies God, that caused somebody else looking in the shadows to think to themselves, why are they always so happy? Why is she always so bubbly? Why is he always calm? Whatever that is that causes somebody else to look at you in observation, that brings glory back to God, because if it had not been for the Lord who was on your side, you know, there are times where people will ask you, what is it about you? Now, the door opens, and you can begin to share your faith. It's, it's because of the grace of God in my life. It's the goodness of God. It's no goodness of my own. You begin to share of who Jesus Christ is in your life and what he's done for your life. It is a testimony that pleases God. You don't get a testimony until you've been tested. That's why you have hardship. That's why you have trouble. That's why you have tribulation. That's why you go through things that sometimes you wonder why. It's not always because of you, but it's because of somebody that's close to you and connected to you that needs to hear from you, and they don't need your sympathy where you say, I can only imagine what you're going through. Sometimes they need your empathy. You need to be able to feel what other people are feeling. And so sometimes God will allow you to go through, but James says, count it all joy in chapter 1 and verse 2 when you find yourself in diverse temptation. Trouble on this side, trouble on that side. Count it all joy. And in the midst of that, have a testimony that pleases God. That's right, Enoch had a testimony that pleased God. Testify until God is pleased. Live your life later for living a life to please those that you can't please. Don't care how much you change your hair, how long you grow it, how short you cut it, what color you dye it. They are never pleased. Later for them. Let me say it one more time. Later for them. Live your life until God is pleased. Testify through your life until God is pleased. We used to have a sign in the sanctuary when I was a kid growing up in the church that you can preach a better sermon with your life than with your lips. Let your life please God. Ask him, Lord, what path will you have me to take? Who will you have me to speak to today? Rather than getting up in the morning and dreading to go in here to work, or dreading to get online, or dreading to do whatever it is you have to do, Lord, thank you for this day. Ah, thank you for your faithfulness. Thank you for your strength. Thank you for your grace. Now use me today to impact somebody. Let my life speak volumes of your faithfulness to it, of your mercy to it, of your love to it, of your forgiveness to it, until somebody around me today at the corner store, in the supermarket, hallelujah, at the gas station. I was dealing with business a couple of weeks ago, pulled into the gas station to get some gas, and uh, the gas attendant, you know, I speak to him, good morning, sir, and uh, he speaks back and he says, where are you from? Uh, I, I don't see many people coming through uh, this area, you know, through Connecticut and upstate New York, the area that I was in, northern uh, part of Jersey, and, and he was just going on and on, and, and uh, you, you really, your, your disposition, and, and he was just so, so impressed and so impacted, and he said at the end, God bless you. I said, that's it. God has blessed me. That's why you're impacted by this moment. God has blessed me. Not only has he blessed me, but Jehovah, he is my God. He's my Savior. And just open up just a moment of where I could share my faith. But the point that I make is that just, just going to the gas station, getting some gas, and the gas attendant is affected by my disposition. Wasn't rude. Didn't, didn't get out of character, but it impacted him. And I'm saying it's the same for you if you would be more conscious to say, I am going to testify, Lord, until you are pleased. Moves on from uh, Abel and, and Enoch and moves into Noah. The Bible said that he prepared an ark to the saving of his family. 
where that those around him was condemned because they didn't believe in his preaching. He preached a message for 120 years. It's going to rain, it's going to rain, it's going to rain. But while he was preaching, he was building, he was preparing, God had given him instructions. There are so many Christians who sang the right tune, preachers who preach the right message, prophets who prophesy, but yet they themselves are not building for a future. They are spiritually enriched, but they lead their families in disarray. They are spiritually anointed, but naturally out of order. Noah preached and he prepared an army. Noah declared what God said, but while he was declaring, he was building. He was preparing an army. And I've said to the church time and time again, ABLM, I love you. I love all of you with all my heart. But after I'm finished preaching, if nobody else get on the ark, my wife and my children better be on the ark. I'm doing everything I can to build an ark, trying to get everybody on. But I don't want to be one of those preachers who save the whole world and lose their family. I'd rather follow Noah's example. If the world don't make it, it won't be because I didn't do what God called me to do. But at the end, I've got to build something for the saving of my family. And may I submit to you that you too, parents, leaders, wherever you are, you don't just build for today, you build for tomorrow. You build for lasting impact, days to come. You leave a legacy. You leave a legacy. Even one of our chief justices laid to rest. I was just watching uh, how that the homage and the reverence given to her for her service and, and, and her, her time of serving, and, and rightfully so, and even other giants you know, in our world that have, that have fallen. And there's a certain level of dignity and, and respect and homage that's, that's given. Chief Justice Ruth, and, and, and rightfully so. But what will be said of you? What contribution would you have made? How would your life have testified until it pleased God? You're singing, you're preaching, you're, you're ministering, but will it have a lasting effect? Are you preparing in conjunction with what you're doing spiritually? Is there something in the natural? The ark was natural. Though God had given a word to Noah, he built, he prepared for the future. Because at the end, it was only him, him, his wife, his sons, their wives, the animals of opposite kind to reproduce in order to replenish the world. So God used Noah, and that's why we're here today, because God used Noah. He was building for the future. What comes next after you're gone? What happens to your children? What happens to your grandchildren? What happens to your loved ones? Will you have the testimony like verse 13, these all died in faith? Or will it read, once upon a time, you gave your heart to Jesus? Once upon a time, you joined the church? Or, or, or will, it, will it suggest that, no, you served God all of your days, all the way through? all the way through. We move into our last example tonight, which is Abraham. We talked about Abel. We talked about Enoch. We talked about Noah, as the scripture does. And then it mentions Abraham, that Abraham believed God so much that he left from his familiar ground and went into a place that he had no idea where he was going until the Lord showed him. And then the Lord began to speak to him to say, I'm going to give you a seed, and from that seed, it will be innumerable. It will be unmeasurable. As the sea and the shore and the stars in the sky, you won't be able to know. And here God spoke this word to a man that was old and his wife was old and her womb considered dead, but yet God spoke to him. And Abraham believed God till he looked for a city, as the Bible said, uh, whose foundations, uh, uh, whose builder and maker was God. He looked for it. He, he expected it. He had faith in God. He expected 
to see what God had said. It was his faith. It was his faith that brought about Isaac. And here we are, here we are as sons and daughters of God, but children after the seed of Father Abraham. Father Abraham had many sons, and many sons had Father Abraham. But when you read in Galatians 3, even aside from the song that we learned as children, you'll find out that if we be Christ, apostrophe S, belonging to Christ, we are Abraham's, apostrophe S, seed. Which means we have this spiritual inheritance and the entitlement of the promise that God made to Abraham because, because we are tied to the promise through Jesus Christ. But that means nothing if you don't have faith to accept it, if you don't have faith to believe it. And it's not just faith now to accept it. It's, 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 it's living by faith, walking by faith, talking by faith, and then at some point, my friend, you and I will die, dying in faith. And I submit to you that a lot of your, a lot of your problems and a lot of your pressure, let me give you the fourth point first, a spiritual inheritance, a spiritual inheritance. These all died in faith. They made a contribution. They had a testimony that pleased God. They were building for a future that even they themselves would not be a part of. Nonetheless, they kept on building. They kept preparing until ultimately they left a spiritual inheritance. It wasn't just Abraham and Sarah, but his seed was blessed. Isaac, Jacob, Joseph. The Bible goes on the list. The writer says, time won't allow us to write all of the heroics of faith. Deborah, Barak, Daniel, Moses. Just read down through Hebrews 11. By faith, through faith, by faith, through faith. It's what caused them to navigate through the tough seasons of their life. So that Moses, uh, rather than enjoy the pleasures of, of, of sin, he chose to suffer with the people, esteeming the reproach of Christ, rather than enjoying the pleasures of Egypt. I want to tell you tonight, you can make it. You can endure. You will endure. You, you will make it. You will be a part if you make up in your mind that for God I live, for God I die. When you, when you look at the whole idea of spiritual inheritance, I can remember, I can remember my God when my, my grandmother, the spiritual matriarch of our, of our family, had come to a point where she had gotten tired in her body, and, she's, and, she's, and she was sickly for some time and had gone into the hospital, and there was one of the members of the church that was sitting by her bedside, and she looked over at the member and said, uh, why am I here? I'm, I'm, I'm ready to go home. And you know, the member of the church at the time was talking with her, and the member actually thought that uh, she meant her natural home in this earth. But, but it wasn't minutes later that that she had gone into cardiac arrest and, and, and we found out later that she was talking about her home in heaven. Just like here, these died in faith, looking for a better country, looking for a city that God has prepared. We don't, we don't sing much of the songs we used to sing, talking about heaven, talking about the realm of the eternal talking about the paradise. We don't, we don't sing those songs like we used to, but we used to sing songs like, if you live right, heaven belongs to you. If you walk upright, heaven belongs to you. We used to sing songs like, it's the highway to heaven. None can walk up there but the pure in heart. We used to sing songs like, the windows of heaven are open. The fire is falling tonight. We, we used to talk about the idea that we like the list of these heroics of faith. They understood that there were pilgrims passing through and that they could not get too connected to this world because, because this world, this temple, and the things of this world are temple. But there is an eternal rest. There is an eternal place. There is, a, there is an, eternal, an eternal place of glory where we will, according to 2 Corinthians 5, receive for the good that we've done, the bad will be judged, we'll receive our eternal reward. 
These all die in faith. What spiritual inheritance will you leave behind? What spiritual inheritance will you leave behind? As we celebrate and remember the life of even our mother Elizabeth Curry, who have transitioned, going on to be with the Lord. And the time will come when we will meet with her family and celebrate in some fashion that of a home going as we call it. But she left a spiritual inheritance. Oh, she left a model that we can follow. She's outlived so many. She's a faith in God. A walk with God. A relationship with God. It's a spiritual inheritance. Lord, I, I, I can just think of those that were instrumental in my life as a kid coming up. I just talked about uh, my grandmother, spiritual matriarch, led her family to the Lord. My mother, as a result, I'm serving God. I, I can talk about the likes of my predecessor, the late bishop, Dr. James Thompson. God used that man to preach and herald the truth of the gospel of Jesus to what was called the Truth Evangelistic Temple, that souls came and were saved and baptized in the Holy Ghost. And here we have a school today because a man that had a vision to evangelize the world while educating, made a contribution. The likes of others that, that have gone on and have worked with him, like Mother Elizabeth Curry, like Sister Sarah Watkins, and Sister Carrie Robinson, and Mother Bobby Robinson, and Mother Catherine Smith, and Lord have mercy, so many that have come through, that have left a spiritual inheritance. Elder Franklin and Mother Franklin. So many, so many. The late Bishop Richard Green, talking about a spiritual inheritance. Those that impacted, those that made contributions. Going back to the Cornerstone Church and Bishop Grady Dale. And just a, a month ago, just a little bit over a month, we laid to rest our spiritual matriarch, Mother Mary Dale. Talking about a spiritual inheritance. I want for my life, when it comes to its end, to read that he died in faith. The faith, as the scripture says, not having received all the promises, but, but they were persuaded that the promises were true, and they embraced them by faith. And they sought for a better country, a far more better country. I say while you're here on earth, travel. Go see all you can see. Go do all you can do. Make the best of your life. But remember, you are a pilgrim passing through. And your time will come. My time will come. Our time will come. But what will be said? Will it be said that these, as they, in Hebrews 11, being referenced, Will it be said the same concerning you? As that is my prayer and that is my determination that it will be said of me that I died in faith. I accepted Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior by faith. I walked out my faith. I died in faith. But not without leaving a spiritual inheritance. Every now and again, my little girls are in the house and they're, hallelujah, thank you, Jesus, clapping their hands and lifting their hands and, and, and one of them even... One of them even speak in tongues. They got their own tongue they speak in it. But you know what they do? They're mimicking what they see. They're mimicking what they hear. And I give God the glory for that. Because as a kid, that's what I did. I played church until I understood it. And now I'm walking out my faith. But it had to start somewhere. I challenge all of the parents to stop watching the stream alone and sit your kids down in front of your device. Call them to attention. Oh, there's an all-out attack and challenge to the church today to reach the kids and minister to the kids. You think the educational system is having it tough. Even the Christian education, there's an attack against it because they are the next generation. They are the ones to carry on. My God, if there were no as I stated, as we're celebrating and remembering tonight, Mother Elizabeth Curry's, that there, there could be no me's. And the same is true with the children that you're raising. If you, as the parent, the father, the mother, the grandmother, the grandfather, the big sister, whoever you are, don't call to attention 
and hallowed times in your home for Bible study and prayer. Just because your kid is not leaving the house, maybe they're, maybe they're in remote session, still anoint them with oil. Still carry out your faith. Still pray over them. Still speak the word of the Lord over them. That's part of their spiritual inheritance. They can't give back or, or recall or regurgitate what has not been poured into them. There must be a seed. There, there must be a deposit. And I am summoning every parent of A Better Life Ministry to make sure that your child is participating with the key kids, participating with the plug ministry if they're teenagers in high school, and even our young adult ministry, college students. I check on our college students. I'm reaching out to them. I'm praying for them. You know what? Because they have a soul and they are not only, we talk about the prosperity of ministry and life, but what about posterity? There must be somebody that carries on legacy. There must be somebody, as we're building, that will, that will take the torch and succeed and run off. That does not happen until you make a contribution, until you have a testimony that pleases God until you build for a future and ultimately leave a spiritual inheritance. There are times as I close and get ready to pray that I make it to the bedside of those of, who die in faith. They transition. I was getting an update from Mother Lynette Williams even concerning Mother Sally Adams and she's going to update me and say some things to me and I knew which questions to ask because I have stood up many of times around the bedside of those that right before they get ready to transition, before they take their last breath, I know the stare that they, that they give on where you think that they're looking at you, but at some point, like, like these who die in faith, they begin to stare beyond you. Hallelujah. It, it's, it's as if that they're already looking into the next country. Sometimes they become very silent. They, they stop talking. They're not saying anything. Eyes focus. It's as if that they are like these who die in faith. They're looking, looking for the promise of the ultimate, the eternal rest. I've seen and witnessed those moments. Stood by families and prayed them through the time of transition. Sometimes they begin in their last words to call out for people who've already gone on. And I want to say to you that your time will come, my time will come. I'm not spooking you out. I'm just reminding you that we are pilgrims passing through. As I was reading a book today concerning a preacher who had wrote concerning the man who had died, 2 Kings 4, left his widow and two sons. The creditors were coming to take her two sons. And the preacher became curious and asked God, well, done my study, but I, I, I've never found the age of this man. And so he asked God, he says, I'll, I'll ask you, Lord, since you were there when he died, how old was he when he died? And he said that the Lord answered him back and said, old enough to die. In other words, the Lord didn't give him a number in the sense of an age, but he said the man was old enough to die. I want to say to you tonight that you are old enough to die. But when you die, how will it read in your obituary? How will it read during your celebratory of life and, and the script? Will it read like this subject matter of these heroics of faith? These all die in faith. God, we love you tonight. And we thank you. You all things well. You're marvelous. You're glorious, you're majestic, you're powerful. Hallelujah. And we say thank you for this time in your word in the middle of the week. You caused us to pause in this sobering discourse tonight to be reminded that we are pilgrims passing through. We are to wear this world as a loose garment. We are to take every day and make the best of it. But not just for ourselves, we are to make a contribution. We are to have a testimony 
until it pleases you. We are supposed to build while we're singing and while we're ministering and while we're teaching. We're supposed to build for the future until we leave a spiritual inheritance. So that at the end it can say, these all die in faith. If you have never received Jesus Christ as Lord and Savior, do that right now. Don't let this moment pass. Don't let it be said, when I was a kid, I went to Sunday school, I went to church. That's not enough to save you. Salvation is saved, being saved, and it shall be saved. Backslider, come back home. Recommit yourself. Recommit your life. Renew your mind. Renew your faith. Do it tonight. Do it tonight. Do it tonight. So that your testimony can be, these all die in faith. There's a fight for your faith. There's a fight for your faith. You thought the enemy was after your money. He's after your faith. You thought the enemy was after your marriage. He's after your faith. You thought he was after your children. He's after your faith. That's why Jesus says to Simon, I pray for you that your faith would fail not. And maybe there's somebody you want to join this church. You've been watching and listening and liking and sharing and, and you're blessed by this ministry. Come on and be a part of it. Come on and be a member. You can do it remotely from where you are. Go to our website, ablm1.org hit the link member or partner and we'll make the appropriate connections and we'll receive you in. We'll receive you in. You don't want it to be set at the end. We don't know. We don't know. We don't know what church they belong to. We don't know who their pastor is. No. You want to make your election sure as relate to your eternal rest and even your church home. Having a place that you can call home and a family and a pastor. And I'd love to be that to you. I'd love to be that to you. This is our prayer tonight. This is our appeal. We trust that you were blessed. Now I'm asking that all of the members, all of the members, but honor the Lord in your giving. First, we honor the Lord with the tithe. Then, we give God an offering. We give God an offering. Some of you tune me out. You don't pay me no mind. But obedience is better than sacrifice. And I challenge you to offer up unto the Lord. Now, in the moment, a gift that says, Lord, I thank you. Lord, I appreciate you for your goodness, for your provision. In the middle of the week, we, we ask for the members to sanctify, set it aside, make it special, $20, and offer it up to the Lord. And so I'm asking that all of the members would do that, all of the leaders, even our friends and viewers, you were blessed, so back into the ministry that has blessed you tonight. I'm going to do mine. I'm not going to ask you to do what I'm not willing to do. Join in together. Do it now. Let's honor the Lord in our giving. We believe here at A Better Life Ministry that the key to life is a better life. Until Sunday morning, right here, 10 a.m. For those of you that will come physically, don't forget to register. Go to our website, ablm1.org, and register for Sunday service. Others that will watch online, remotely from where you are. Be blessed. God bless you. Go in peace. Thank you.